disks. Right. So um, for our agenda today, um, we are going to jump right into COVID-19 cases to discuss um, the current rates and statistics here in Sacramento County, discuss vaccine updates, and again, ways to effectively communicate. So I would like to jump in and introduce our first guest speaker. All right, next slide, please. And um, as a reminder, um, as community leaders, um, you really are the influencers and the people that have built the rapport with your clients and community at large. And so we really want our participants here, as well as the clients you serve to feel like they can rely on you as trusted um, relays of information to really change the conversation and allow people to hear the hardcore facts to understand the best ways to prepare themselves and ensure safety among their families and communities. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Today, we have senior public health nurse, Fu Tran. Fu has a passion for public health and has been in the field for 30 years with an emphasis on vulnerable populations, infectious disease, patient advocacy, harm reduction, and more. He has published peer-reviewed journals and articles and presented at public health conferences. He has worked for the CDC, Georgia and Sacramento County Departments of Public Health, and multiple hospitals and nonprofit public health agencies. Thank you so much for being here, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Monica, for that wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Um, welcome, everybody, to our presentation. Um, we have lots of information, and we are looking forward to you uh, viewing our presentation. Next slide, please. So first thing, as Monica said, we'll, we will be talking about COVID-19 data, case, cases, deaths, vaccination rates. Next slide, please. So some data here. Um, as you can see, um, Sacramento County, um, from the beginning to now, we have 1,907 uh, deaths in our county. And for um, for Sacramento County cases to date are 133,480. And as you can see, the U.S. deaths rates are right there, as you can see, as well as the U.S. death, uh, the case rates. Next slide, please. So in the U.S. each day, around 42,000 newly reported cases are happening. 231 newly reported COVID deaths. For Sacramento County, we have around uh, 2,400 uh, new, newly reported cases and, and uh, seven newly reported ca uh, cases as of August 29th. Next slide, please. So this is a very important information right here. As you can see the, on the left, um, it is death by race and ethnicity. And as you can see here, the native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, they have the highest rate is 303 uh, per 100,000. And if you can see the, the next uh, couple two highest are black and uh, American Indian uh, American, Native American population uh, with the uh, black population is 137.2 deaths per 100,000. And with the American um, Indian uh, Native American, it's 145 per 100,000. Um, for case 
cases by rate and ethnicity, as you can see here, the, the, uh, the group that is taking the most, uh, that has the most cases is um, black, uh, black individuals, as well as native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. Um, black, uh, black individuals has around 7,421 cases per 100,000. And native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders is around 700, 7,406 per 100,000. And then Hispanic is the third one after that with 6,769 per 100,000 cases. So as you can see here, uh, minority cases, um, they are, it's affecting minority cases uh, very much so. Next slide, please. And so you all have probably seen this before. This is the epi curve um, as of uh, as up to this date. Um, you can see there, there's two waves, or three waves, I'm sorry. And uh, one in the initial, one um, during the winter time. And now uh, this, there's a surge right now. Um, cases are, are pretty high. So, uh, Next slide, please. All right, we're gonna talk about vaccinations. Um, next slide, please. So in California, um, we have administered 46 million vaccines. And a, a great thing about this is 66% have been fully vaccinated. And we are approximately getting 91,000 uh, doses per day given in the state of California. Next slide, please. So for Sacramento County, we have um, a little bit more than 1.5 million vaccines administered. Um, for the full, uh, fully vaccinated, we have 51% fully vaccinated with almost 3,000 doses per day on average. Next slide, please. So here is another very important um, uh, table that I have for you. So um, this is as of uh, July 30th uh, of 2021, and this is fully vaccinated by race and ethnicity. As you can see here, the two lowest groups, um, the lowest group is Hispanic with 27% fully vaccinated. The next highest is not far behind. Um, it's the non-Hispanic Black with 28.69%. And so as you can see, there are these other numbers, but we can see that there is a health disparity among uh, uh, certain groups that are um, less vaccinated. And definitely you all being here, we definitely wanna to try to bring um, vac vaccinations overall up, but especially these, uh, these groups. Um, as, and as you can see before in the slides, um, I mentioned earlier, these groups also have high case rates. And so, um, and next slide, please. So this is a very astonishing uh, slide here. So um, this is vaccine effectiveness. Um, so as you can see here, so for, so for cases, so for, uh, for individuals who are fully vaccinated, we have almost 5,000 cases. But for those who are not fully vaccinated, we have almost up to 130,000 cases. And then for those individuals who have passed away for the va vaccination status, for this is for Sacramento County. For, uh, for those who are deceased, 16, uh, 16 of them are fully vaccinated compared to um, almost 2,000 who are not fully vaccinated. So as you can see here, the, um, the vaccines do have a lot of um, you know, effectiveness. As you can see, there's a huge difference between um, you know, the fully vaccinated and the not fully vaccinated. And this data is from the Sacramento County COVID-19 uh, dashboard. Okay, um, next slide, please. Okay, so, any questions? And I think someone raised their hand. 
They did. I saw that. So as a reminder, um, if you can just write your question directly in the Q&A tab, it's directly to the left of the chat feature, and then I can read your question out loud. So maybe we'll just give a moment to let folks um, directly type in their question. And for those of you who are new to the Q&A, um, the Q&A button will look just like um, the icons you see on this slide here. So you should have that feature to click on and then type in your question. So um, I don't seem to see any questions at this time. Um, so perhaps um, after we complete our following session, we can just um, continue on with the questions at that point. Oh, it looks like we did get one. Okay, so actually there are two for you here, um, Nurse Tran. So first question is, is there any data for pregnant women? So um, for that question, I think um, Dr. Uh, Ritanasan, he can answer that um, more. Uh, better than for me. And for the last chart is, the last chart are those people who got sick after. So that is, um, if you could, um, if you could, uh, Derek, if you can go back to that, um, the fully vaccinated uh, slide, please. So, um, oh no, uh, no, go to the one, one more forward, please. So for right here, oh no, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> you were. So just, yes, this one, right? Oh, this, the one with the red and the blue. So one after this and that's it. Oh, no, go forward. Here, here, the red and the blue. So with the last chart, so the question is, the last chart are those people um, that got sick after. So um, the data here doesn't say, but um, I am, I'm involved in cases, uh, outbreaks and cases. And so um, there's a good chance that these individuals um, got, um, they, they got sick and got tested. And then when, you know, when they get tested, they find out if they are fully vaccinated or not vaccinated. So I do not know the information there, but most of the time when people get sick, they get tested. So I don't have that exact data. Um, have they determined if 12 year olds will be vaccinated as of yet? So for the Pfizer vaccine, um, that is, um, it is uh, approved for that, for, for the, for 12 and older. Let's see, let's see. Are we considered fully vaccinated only having two shots and not the booster? So after your two shots or the one, so if it's a two shot series um, and then two weeks after the last shot, then you're fully vaccinated. And that is Pfizer and that is Moderna. If you did the one shot vaccine, which is Johnson & Johnson, then um, two weeks after you're fully vaccinated. With the booster, um, so it doesn't count. So you can be fully vaccinated without the booster. All right, let's see. And Dr. Uh, Ritanasan, he can probably answer that question uh, even further. Um, let's see, for the tables of race and ethnicity, ethnicity are the numbers showing total population of race or does this include? So this includes everybody. So let's see for the, yeah, so the total population for each, uh, each, each group. Um, and yes, so um, are there any other questions? Oh. So this next question, um, let's see, if someone is tested positive, how long after uh, when a person can get vaccinated safely? I think this question probably can be answered better by Dr. Ritanasan. Um, and so I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Um, Ritanasan answer this question. What is the importance, importance of everyone being vaccinated? Why does it matter if some people are not vaccinated and some are? So that uh, question is for you, Dr. Ritanasan. You, you're definitely able to answer better. 
And so any I other, think, oh, sorry, go for it. Any other questions? Go ahead, Monica, sorry. Right. Fantastic, well, thank you so much, Nurse Tran. Um, you know, as we go along with today's presentation, there will be some additional times to ask your questions. So if we don't read yours, we haven't forgotten about you and we will come back to that. So I wanted to take this um, time to move into our next portion. Um, so we have here Dr. Milan Ratanison, and he has been a primary care physician at Kaiser Permanente South Sacramento since 2010. He currently serves as assistant physician in chief of quality and oversees efforts for COVID-19 vaccination, preventative health care, and eliminating health disparities. So I would like to let him jump in and share about our next portion. Thank you. Okay, there we go. Am I, can you hear me now? Okay, I just wanna say excellent questions in the Q&A and we'll make sure to get to all of them because I think that's, that's the juicy stuff, but hopefully I'll address some of this. So let's go to the next slide. Quick recap, right? What is COVID? It is a respiratory illness. When we say respiratory, we primarily mean the lungs, the nose, that whole respiratory tract. It belongs to a large group of viruses called coronaviruses. By the way, that corona comes from the word crown, and that's what you see, those little spikes on there on the virus, which kind of act like a crown. And it's those spikes that allow the virus to attach to your respiratory tract, your lungs, and then cause a lot of damage. We know COVID spreads from person to person, usually through droplets in the air. So when you're coughing, sneezing, you're talking to someone, you don't even know it, and that can carry the virus and spread to you. Um, most transmission is thought to be in folks who might not have symptoms at the time. And that's kind of tricky. I want you to think about like today, right now, what if you were sick today, right now, woke up feeling really sick, okay? Now you'd have to think yesterday. Think about all the people you came into contact with yesterday, because those are the people that you probably uh, infected or, or transmitted to. And so that's why it's been so difficult to try to control this. And the tricky thing here is COVID affects different people in different ways and the symptoms can range from mild to severe illness. And the truth is that most people would probably feel mild symptoms, but the problem is that enough people will feel moderate to severe illness that will cause a domino effect and really tip the scales for our health systems and for our economy. Next slide. And so now we have the Delta variant. And what's been the problem with Delta? Let's go to the next slide. The biggest thing is it is much more contagious than the prior strains. And how we see that is you can see that the case rates now, when they rise, if you were looking at graphs before and they kind of go up like this and down like this, right? Well, if you look at the current surges, let's take Florida, for example, or Louisiana or Mississippi, you'll see that those, um, those curves now, they are much steeper. They go, instead of like this, they're going like this. And so it spreads much faster from person to person. And what we're seeing now, as we try to go back to normal, it's really the unvaccinated people who are at the highest risk. And the problem is that Delta, before you know it, leads to these hyper-local outbreaks, which can spread really rapidly. And with COVID, a theme has been as we are learning as we're going. And never before have you seen people see the sausage being made, right? And that's why there's so much confusion and news out there. And so we're still learning about Delta right now, but the good news is we still know a lot that applies to COVID that will apply to Delta as well. And what we've seen is vaccination continues to be by far the best protection against Delta. Next slide. Okay, so what are the different COVID symptoms? You can see here. So briefly, think about how you feel when you get a cold or think about how you feel when you have the flu or you got food poisoning or you think it's allergies. All of those things could be COVID symptoms. And I really wanna stress this point here. It's impossible to tell just based on the symptoms alone, okay? So you see these symptoms here and you can try to guess and you can ask your friends, well, what did you have when you had COVID? Do I have that? Oh, I don't think it's COVID, you know? Or you'll ask your family or someone who else had, or you look online. Here's the problem with that. Mix and match any of those symptoms right there and it could be COVID. So you really don't know. And I really want to uh, really stress that point. 
is we really can't guess about this. Have I been wrong when I thought somebody didn't? You know, I told them to get tested anyways, but I didn't think they had it. Yeah, I've been wrong. They had it. And the opposite. Oh, I think you have it. They get tested and it's negative and they don't have it, right? My point here is if you're feeling these symptoms right now, it's important you take them seriously and you don't think, oh, it's just allergies. Is What you should do is then get tested as soon as, as possible and um, essentially call out for work until you know that you um, are, uh, are negative. Next slide. Uh, and here's the tricky part. You can be finally infected with COVID even if you don't have any symptoms. And that's what we call the asymptomatic carriers that potentially can spread it. Next slide. All right, we're gonna pause there for Q and A and maybe, um, and the next section is gonna be about vaccine. So I'm gonna save, I'm gonna look at these questions again. I'm gonna save some of those uh, vaccine questions for after that, but let me see. Okay. So all these are about vaccines. So maybe I'll pause there if any questions about COVID, the virus itself, before we move on to vaccines. And I promise you, I'll get to all those questions. Oh, I do see one here for you, Dr. Rosanna Sen at the bottom. Well, someone is asking, how will the shots protect you from the new Delta strain um, if it's made for the original COVID strain? Um, would that be something you'd be able to answer from this section? Yeah, I can answer that. So that's a very good question because that is correct, that the uh, vaccines we're giving now were created for the original strain. And what we've seen is that they have held up from the prior variants as well. So there was the alpha variant that took over the UK, and now we have the delta variant. And what we're seeing is that the vaccine has continues to be highly effective against hospitalization and death. And so if you're fully vaccinated, you can consider yourself highly, highly protected, um, over 90% protected against hospitalization and death from Delta. Now, are there some breakthrough infections happening? You, maybe people on this call even know people who are fully vaccinated yet still got infected and got sick, right? They are happening, but the good news is that one, it's thought to be uncommon. Two is that if it does happen, uh, it's usually mild disease. So it might feel like a cold or something like that. But we know that those people for the most part are not ending up in the hospital or worse dying. And that makes a big difference. I have to stress that as much as possible as you hear in the news a lot about death and death absolutely is the most important thing um, and the most tragic, the most devastating consequence of COVID. But what I want people to realize is hospitalization is a huge um, issue with COVID, right? Just think about if you were ever had a problem before, let's say you got in a car accident. You know, I'll speak to patients who said, ever since that car accident two years ago, I've had these back issues, right? Now picture yourself saying, ever since I was hospitalized with COVID, you know, I've been tired, short of breath, not feeling well. I can't go to work as regularly as I used to. My partner, my family have to take time off work to help care for me. You see that domino effect is just so devastating. And we probably don't hear enough about that. And so um, with hospitalization, that's, that's, that's just a super important to think about. And for example, how would you feel if I told you, you came to me with these problems and I said, well, at least you didn't die, sorry, right? That, that's, not, that's not the empathy we need for our patients. Is, is, it's not just about death. It's about the significant uh, illness that people get afterwards and the, the, the lingering effect that has on themselves, their families, their caregivers, their friends, their coworkers, the community. You see that huge domino effect there. Thank you so much. And actually there's a two part to that as well. So how does it protect you if you have already had COVID? Um, some people have been told by their doctors that they're immune. Great question. So if you've had COVID, your natural immunity has kicked in and your natural immunity is very good. Um, we know it's very good for at least the first three months. After that, your natural immunity may start to decrease and getting the vaccine is like updating your immune system again. So think about your iPhone. It's like getting the latest update for your iPhone. Hey, you're up, your iPhone probably works really well right now, but let's update and get you the latest software, right? So we have studies that show that people who had already had COVID but got vaccinated um, had a higher antibody response. So their antibodies were boosted up again. And they've actually had a, a, a study that compared folks who had um, prior COVID versus folks who were fully vaccinated. And we saw that the folks who had prior COVID, they actually still got reinfected more than the folks who were fully vaccinated. And so we also know that the vaccine has been extremely safe. You know, um, over 200 million Americans, think about that, over 200 million Americans 
that have been um, have had at least one shot. And another way to think about the statistics that we saw earlier in um, in Sacramento is more than seven out of 10 have had one shot in Sacramento. And so one way to think about that is in your everyday life, as you're walking around, just look around you. Seven out of those 10 people have probably had one shot and they're going about their lives just normally. So, so that's the way I kind of look at the, 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 the kind of real world feeling of safety. Wonderful. And so maybe we'll ask one last question for this section before you jump more into the vaccine specifics. Um, so there's a question here, um, are COVID related deaths related to blood types or DNA? Great question. These kinds of things are really hard to pinpoint exactly what the value of that information is. So you might've seen like, is there a blood type associated with a higher risk for death, right? And what you're seeing is that you, maybe we, we just don't know. And so as a doctor, I'll tell you this, there's so much of that type of information, not just for COVID, for every kind of disease, there's tons of maybes, right? What do I do with that information? To be honest, for me, it doesn't help me. A maybe doesn't help me. It doesn't change what I'm gonna tell the patient, you know? If, um, so, so it's a nice to know, maybe, but it doesn't change what I want people to know, right? Which is, you know, you gotta protect yourself by getting fully vaccinated. And in the times of surge, when things are up right now, you wanna be careful about, you know, masking indoors and, uh, and being in, in, in crowded groups together. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritanison. So I'm gonna hold on these questions and let you jump into the next session to talk more about the vaccine. Sure. All right, so let's talk about the vaccines and their effectiveness. So we've got three choices right now. So you've got Pfizer, which is two doses. You've got Moderna, which is two doses. You've got Johnson & Johnson, which is one dose. The Pfizer vaccine is the one that has been recently FDA approved. So fully approved um, for 16 and above. For folks 12 to ages 15, they can still get vaccinated with Pfizer, uh, but it's under what's called the emergency use authorization. So we're still waiting formal FDA approval for that. Uh, but the EUA and the data we have so far uh, tells us that it's safe for um, those folks 12 to 15 to get vaccinated. My daughter, she's 12, she got vaccinated, she had Pfizer. Um, Pfizer and Moderna, again, Moderna is not FDA approved yet, but operates off of the same mRNA technology as Pfizer. And so I tell folks Pfizer and Moderna are kind of like Coke and Pepsi, you're getting a soda, that, that's what matters. Uh, Johnson & Johnson is one dose, it's uh, for 18 and above. And then two weeks after the Johnson & Johnson, you're considered fully vaccinated. Two weeks after the second dose of Moderna or Pfizer, you're considered fully vaccinated. And personal story here, you know, in the beginning, um, when vaccine supply was limited, you had to get what you get, right? You get what you get, you don't get upset. That's all we had on hand. The nice thing I think now is we have so much vaccine that you really do get to choose. And so you can choose whichever one you feel most comfortable with. And we'll get into that too. But I'll tell you personal story is I had Pfizer uh, my wife had Johnson & Johnson. My parents and in-laws both had Moderna. And that wasn't planned at all. That was just because you get what you get. And um, I, I tell that, that kind of worked out for me because I get to tell patients, I'm walking the walk right there. I'm, I'm very happy that they were all vaccinated. It's okay that they got different ones. Um, and, you know, it was to their, to their uh, um, comfort level, right? And so my wife, for example, wanted just to get one shot. So she got Johnson & Johnson. And we'll get into a little bit more in those specifics too on those vaccines. So next slide. All right, we know now, again, just the data is just tremendous, right? Um, 200 million Americans, but really doses is like 360 million, I think, doses in America. 5 billion doses in the world that have been given. I don't think there's been anything ever that I can think of that's been given to so many people around the world uh, with so many people watching for something to go wrong from every industry too, not just the medical industry, everybody has got their eyes on this to see uh, if something goes wrong. And so we have tremendous data to show that it's safe and effective. And even to this date, we're continuing to monitoring for safety. Next slide. So how do they work? So let's start with just the mRNA vaccine. So let's take you back to that spike protein, right? So if we were to be in a, uh, uh, you know, a basketball game and I wanted to get the other team's playbook, right? So I can have a, a, a leg up on them, right? 
That's what these vaccines do. Essentially, you're getting their playbook in advance. And what's the playbook for? It's for their secret play, the spike protein. So what the mRNA is, it, con it contains the instructions to how to build the spike protein. Not the virus, but just the spike protein. The spike protein by itself is harmless. Um, it's when the spike protein is attached to the virus that causes problems. So what the vaccine does is deliver that mRNA, just those instructions to your body. So you can then look at it. You're looking at the playbook. You can plan ahead for it. Your body then builds that spike protein, okay? And then once you've built that spike protein, your body then recognizes it with your own natural immune system to build antibodies against that spike protein. And then what you end up with is antibodies that have now been built up and are ready to go should they happen to see the real virus. Now, the, um, the J Johnson & Johnson vaccine works very similar to that. Instead of mRNA, uh, the instructions for the spike protein, it contains DNA. What happens in all of our bodies with any kind of DNA in our own bodies is that DNA gets converted into mRNA and then the mRNA gets converted into protein. That is the, the building block and process of life. And so um, instead of using mRNA, it's just using a step right before making the mRNA, the DNA. Your body is very smart. It knows that once it gets this information, it destroys that information. It doesn't incorporate it into your own DNA. It doesn't stay as a part of you. It reads the playbook. It trashes the playbook. It knows what it needs to do now. And that's the, the remarkable thing about the vaccines. Now, why do Pfizer and Moderna take two shots, but Johnson & Johnson takes one shot, right? Well, those are the vaccines, the way they've been developed and studied. And so Moderna and, and, and Pfizer, what they do is you're getting that playbook that first time, right? And it's like you're getting the playbook a second time. Let's let's just make sure you know this right and get ready to do this right. And Johnson and Johnson um, is that one dose. Now there are in other countries there are some studies showing um, looking at uh, like AstraZeneca is similar to Johnson and Johnson. It uses DNA. Um, that's a two dose regimen over in the UK. So we're still learning more about this. But right now, all you have to know is two doses for Pfizer and Moderna, one dose for Johnson and Johnson. Next slide. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, I said this. So um, Johnson & Johnson contains the DNA instead of the mRNA, okay? Neither, none of the vaccines contain the actual virus. It's a piece, it's not even a piece of the virus. It's the instructions to building the spike protein. It's not the spike protein itself, it's the instructions. And so your body then builds uh, the spike protein using your own body's proteins or amino acids, I should say. So uh, this is really a very natural process in that you're getting kind of just a hint of what to do and your body's just doing the rest. It's really remarkable. Next slide. All right, so a lot of busy slides here. This is a bunch of numbers. This is just to let you know, right? So it's, what is it? It's September. We started vaccinating healthcare workers first in December, uh, January, right? So nine months but really not just nine months of vaccine out there, but the months before that, the original trials, which started in the summer of last year. And those trials tested in tens of thousands of people. You'll see here 43,000 in Pfizer, 28,000 in Moderna, 40,000 in Johnson & Johnson, not just here in the US, but um, across different countries as well. During the original strain for Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson was actually uh, around when um, there were other strains as well. And so what they saw in those trials were uh, very highly effective. So 95% effective against infection, 100% against death. In Johnson & Johnson, it was less against infection, 66%, but still 85% against severe disease, and then 100% protection against death. What I wanna caution you about comparing these numbers is you really can't compare them apples to apples because these were done at different times with different strains at the time. And this is again, the original trial and the original people, right? What you, wanna, what you really wanna know like this is good to know when it's first coming out because this is you got to start somewhere right so you've started somewhere and this is the data that we have that shows hey this is actually really effective um what you really want to know is now put it out in the real world and see what happens right and that's where we're at here luckily time has given us that we are now here in the real world again with 350 million doses um of all these different vaccines and so they all continue to show highly effective protection against hospitalization and death and I, I, um, there might be a slide to get to this or I'll get into the questions, but are we starting to see some decreased effectiveness against um, in like mild disease? We are starting to see some of that, right? So meaning that's why you're seeing some of those breakthrough cases of that. Some people are, even though they've been fully vaccinated, they might be getting breakthrough infections where they get mild disease. But again, what's remaining intact 
is that protection against hospitalization and death. And um, that's super important to know. So let me take it as an individual level. Me, I'm fully vaccinated, right? If my risk of getting COVID right now is really low to begin with because it's protecting me. But if I do get it, if I do get a breakthrough infection tomorrow, what I'm gonna rest assured knowing is that, hey, I am very highly protected against ending up in the hospital, which to be honest, would I be worried about? I would be, you know, I'm 40. Um, unfortunately, my BMI is considered obese, okay? So I have a risk factor, okay? So um, would I be worried? I absolutely would be worried, you know? Um, so, but I'm not because I'm fully vaccinated. So um, something to keep in mind again, that, that distinction that that protection remains intact against hospitalization and death. Next slide. All right, so who was the, who did the trials include? And this is what was really um, um, nice about all of the original trials is they were very representative actually of the US population. And so what you just see here is that we had great representation amongst all the trial participants um, uh, according to race, ethnicity, gender as well, um, representative of people of color in the, these trials as well. Next slide. Okay, so what, uh, what we're reviewing here, just summarizing, right, is that we know that the three vaccines out right now, the, they have all undergone rigorous testing. They've all been monitored in the real world now. They're highly effective against uh, COVID hospitalization and death and, and still maintain efficacy against disease itself. Um, they produce antibody responses. You know, it's, and the other thing I wanna say, it's not just about your antibodies. So uh, to the question originally, I think uh, earlier about, well, how does it know, how does it protect against the Delta if it was originally engineered against the original strain, right? This is the remarkable part of your body is your body makes those antibodies but now that it's read the playbook, your body actually has something called memory B cells and T cells. So your immune system is not just antibodies. It's way more complex than that. It's also different types of cells called B cells and T cells. And guess what? They memorize that playbook so that if your antibodies start to go down, those B cells and T cells remember how to make those antibodies again. Not only do they know how to do that, they know how to adapt those future antibodies against other strains and variants. And so that's why you're still seeing that protection against Delta, against hospitalization and death, even though um, it was not originally made for Delta. Um, and so right now we've got all these, and we've got studies still going, right? They're still looking at, okay, how do people do with boosters? How do they do if uh, some people who got a mix and match dose, right? We don't know all the answers yet, but more, more is coming. And the safety of this has just been rigorously followed, right? There's a, a, a national system called VARES that you may have heard about. Anybody can report to this system. Um, doctors and health systems are required to report to the system if something bad happens after a vaccine, right? Now, if something bad happens after a vaccine, here's the tricky part. And I, I have difficulty, I think, trying to um, explain this and I get it. But essentially, if something bad happens after the vaccine, right, it doesn't necessarily mean the vaccine caused it right? It'd be no different than you eating a cheeseburger today and getting in a car accident tomorrow. Did the cheeseburger cause your, your car accident, right? I, I don't know. I'm probably not, but you know, we, so it's really, it's really, and, and I can get that though. I can get why that would be hard to understand or even to believe is like, well, I was feeling fine until I got this vaccine. Next week, this happened, right? And so we know that some side effects are very real. Um, but we know so far that more of the dangerous things have not been shown to be related to the vaccine. For example, um, I think there's um, a belief out there that people have died from the vaccine, okay? And so um, that hasn't been proven to be a real link to the vaccine. Have some people died after getting the vaccine? Yes. When they do deeper dives, was it due to the vaccine? No. Now, have some people had rare complications, like you might've heard of the blood clots with Johnson & Johnson? Um, yes. And so to date, I think they found about 40 blood clots out of 13 million though, right? So very, very rare. Um, and um, some of those people, I believe it was, I can't remember the exact number, it was a few that may have even died, okay? And so um, is it possible? Yes. Is it very, very, very rare? It is. And so when we, when we have to take into account how we make these recommendations, right? Um, we have to take into account how, how likely is that happening, right? Could you take Tylenol tonight for a headache and then die from the Tylenol? 
It's possible, but is it likely to happen? Very, very unlikely. So I think that's one of the kind of key points too, is that there is risk in everything we do. It's not 100%, but when you take into account the major studies and what you see what the most likelihood uh, 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 risk is, you're very highly likely to be protected from uh, COVID from the vaccine than to have some kind of serious side effect. And by the way, you're much more likely to get COVID and have some kind of serious problem than have a serious problem from the vaccine. So um, let's go to the next slide. I, it might be Q&A already, but. Oh, okay. So vaccines are free. That's the great thing. So I really want people to know you can go to any vaccine site. I mean, what a privilege it is really and really testament to what we can do in America for us to have free vaccines for pretty much anybody um, down the street, you know, rural areas might be difficult, but for us, you know, in, in cities, like you can get it down the street anywhere, you can walk up. Um, they're available for 12 and up for Pfizer, 18 and up for everybody else. Again, more than a billion people have been vaccinated. And we know that's, that's the thing is we know the answer is right in front of us right now. This surge we're ha happening right now is, we can, uh, we can tame it and we can prevent a future one if we get more people vaccinated. And so again, that's what we're seeing right now. In my hospital, UC Davis has publishes their numbers. You can look at any hospital right now. Um, there's some hospitals publish their numbers. You go to Louisiana, go to Texas, go to Florida. You can see their numbers is that most of the people in the hospital are unvaccinated. And, that, and, and the, the, the scary thing is it's younger people now. So it's not uncommon. We'll see 30 year olds, 40 year olds, 50 year olds who are getting, um, in fact, they make up a majority of the hospitalizations now um, um, being, you know, having severe illness. And that's, again, I want to, I want to emphasize the randomness of it, which is scary to me is yes, we've seen that people who have conditions are more likely to get sick, but do we see like regular normal people also um, get really sick? We do. We actually see that in kids too, which is pretty scary. So if you look at the CDC data on all the kids who've been hospitalized so far, uh, I think it's 50% that actually had no condition whatsoever. And so I think that's, that's just something to keep in mind also. And um, I want you to know this last uh, portion here is important, right? That being vaccinated is a personal choice. That's what I tell my patients is I'm not trying to twist, twist your arm, but it's like, I have this amazing thing that is just so powerful and so effective and um, that I believe is, is safe. Um, I'm not trying to twist your arm though, but I'm trying to at least give you the information to um, want, help you make the decision for yourself. Next slide. All right, now Q&A. All right, thank you again. Wonderful um, information so far. And some of our questions overlap a little, so I'll try and condense. So it sounds like we have some folks on the call who are Kaiser members. And they're asking ways they can schedule appointments, um, especially for kids that are now entering school full time. So yes, I think that this question, I'll answer the, I think the question was about testing. Um, so testing, unfortunately, you're seeing right now is that domino effect is what, I, is what I'm talking about. Like uh, is um, everything gets strained and that's why our testing appointments, um, just like the rest of the community, just like the rest of the country is with surge rise in cases, right? Um, and rise in symptoms and trying to get back to normal, more people are getting symptoms now and they need to get tested. So you get this bottleneck that happens, right? So um, the the most, Im the, unfortunately it, it is what it is, is that the, those supplies are strained when we hit to these surges. And that's why you're he hearing about hospital capacity. It just trickles down from trying to get uh, a spot in the ER if you're sick, trying to get a bed in the hospital if you're sick, it trickles all the way down to even the outpatient side. You're not even that sick. You just want to get a test. And it's hard to get, right? And so. Um, unfortunately, every, every lever is being pulled right now. And the, the, you're seeing staffing shortages, right? People get sick and they can't come to work now. They, you know, our own healthcare workers, right? So that's, that's the tough part right now. Um, I will say that um, there is rapid antigen testing. Those are the over-the-counter tests that you can buy. Um, um, a popular one is called Binax Now. And so it's a test you do at home. You swab your nose, you get the results in about 15 minutes. Um, and um, you can get that. However, I caution you though. So if you're symptomatic and you'd use that test and it's positive, then you can consider yourself having COVID, okay? If you're symptomatic and you do that test and it's negative, it doesn't necessarily mean you don't have COVID. You still need to get a, uh, a, the regular, what we call PCR test done, okay? This is for people who are having symptoms. Um, okay. For getting appointments for vaccines with Kaiser, at least, you know, I'll speak to our South Sacramento um, uh, station that's in uh, 
on Bruceville, right across from our med center. It's where the old furniture store was. It's in the same parking lot as that uh, KFC is um, you don't need an appointment. You don't need to be a Kaiser member. You can just come. Um, we don't ask about immigration status. You just come, you walk up, it's free. Um, we are open Monday through Saturday. So close on Sundays, but Monday through Saturday uh, from uh, 8 a.m. to uh, 5 p.m. And I think everywhere else, you know, I was, well, um, I was at Costco the other day, right? So many places, just look, just look for the sign. Uh, the, any places that have pharmacies, they're giving out those vaccines um, for free as walk-ups. Great. So I'm gonna um, kind of look at a, a theme here for some of our next few questions. When we're looking at people who have compromised immune systems, can you speak a little bit about people that have some sensitivities to the flu shot or people wondering why everyone should still be wearing masks even if they've been vaccinated? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think, um, so let's, one is immunocompromised. I think sometimes there is a, there's a misconception that if you have a, a weak immune system, you shouldn't get vaccinated because maybe the vaccine is going to do something to you. It's quite the opposite. If you are, have a weak immune system, then you need to get vaccinated because COVID is what poses a risk to you. So you absolutely should get vaccinated if you have a weak immune system. If you have sensitivities to the flu vaccine, like the flu vaccine makes you sick or the, um, uh, or you've had an allergic reaction to other vaccines in the past, it is actually still okay to get the COVID vaccine because it's different components. And um, the only reason someone can't get a COVID vaccine really is that they've had a severe allergic reaction to the COVID vaccine itself and um, or components of the vaccine. Now, here's the tricky thing though. If you look at the ingredients list of that vaccine, it's got components on there. It's, it's impossible to tell whether those ingredients were in the, the vaccine, you know, I don't know, let's say a flu vaccine you had 10 years ago that, and it's not even clear whether that was a true allergic reaction or not, right? That's, I think that's the tricky part. And I'll tell you this though, I, I do think um, my own father-in-law, he got the flu vaccine. He said it made him sick, right? And I have to explain to him, I, I don't think it was the flu vaccine that made you sick. I think, you know, it's cold and flu season during that time. You got the flu vaccine, a week later, you end up sick with some cold symptoms. I think honestly that that is coincidental. And again, I get it. It's, it's kind of hard to believe that at times you, you feel like I, I was fine, right? But I guess I would tell you, I, I see it all the time is, and the cold is very common. Um, so the, oh, and then masking, right? Why should we wear masks even if you're fully vaccinated, okay? The reason is because of the current surge right now. So when the surge is high, that means that there are more cases in the community. So our risk is higher. And I think that's been a difficult kind of concept to grasp is really that I wish things were, um, were on and off, yes and no, well, answer one, answer two, that's it. But it's so much gray area. So the, 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 the idea is that when cases are really high, that there's just so much more virus out there. And so we should protect ourselves by also masking indoors. Now outside, you're not around people, you know, you're fully vaccinated. You can feel comfortable in not masking there. You know, I take my kids to the park they're, they're playing around. Um, they don't have masks on, but you have to be cautious about when you want to wear that mask and really, um, uh, you know, indoors going inside to a store where there's going to be people you want to mask, even if you're fully vaccinated. Wonderful. So um, I think on this next question here, we're still seeing some um, confusion around the booster. So, you know, for some folks, um, they're wondering um, if we're looking at if a booster is needed or not. And also um, it looks like, excuse me here, quite a few in here now. So I just wanted to make sure I understood that. So in relation to the booster, um, someone was asking, do you think that when people are not, if enough people are not getting vaccinated, that this also provides more of an opportunity for additional variants to come into place? Yes. Yeah, so let's uh, first question about the boosters. There is confusion about that. I think what you need to know right now is if you are immunocompromised and that there's a list, but essentially it's if you're, if you're being treated for cancer right now, or you had a, uh, an organ transplant, your liver transplant, or you had a stem cell transplant, um, if you have untreated or severe HIV, if you are on immunosuppression medication, so that usually means like chronic steroids, or certain types of medications, there are conditions that people are on immunosuppression therapy, like for lupus, or rheumatoid arthritis, 
or Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, um, those folks are the folks who should be getting a, a third dose right now. And the reason is because when they got their first two doses, what we know now is it was great that they got those, those doses, right? But since their immune system was weak to begin with, maybe it did not respond as well to the vaccine. Maybe it didn't create the antibodies it was supposed to. So let's give a third vaccine to those folks so they have another chance. They get to look at the playbook again to build up their, their antibodies again because the first two times they did, maybe they did good, maybe, maybe they didn't build up those antibodies. So it's not that it's dangerous, it's that we just wanna give them another chance, okay? That's for the immunocompromised. For the immunocompetent, so most people who have had their there's two doses, well, they need a booster, uh, uh, you know. Um, that remains to be seen. You're kind of seeing that debate play out right now. And I think in the news, it has suggested that the Biden administration is going to recommend that booster vaccines be given uh, available to everybody, right? We just have to wait to see what those, those, um, those recommendations are, who they're meant to be for. And I think the main thought is why would someone like me need a booster? is because if I, I was vaccinated back in December, and then what, what I've said is now is I'm highly protected against uh, hospitalization and death right now, even though it's been almost, you know, it's been nine months. And even though it's Delta right now, I'm still protected against that. But am I less protected against mild disease? Am I less protected against uh, potentially getting Delta and getting like a common cold, right? And if I get that booster, will it help prevent me from at least getting that common cold? How important is that, right? And I think that's a great question and that's what's being debated right now. On one hand for me, I would say it's very important because um, as a healthcare worker, frontline provider taking care of patients, we don't want me to even have a mild cold that would take me out of the workforce at a time when we need me um, and other, uh, other people out there who are essential. Um, the other thing is, well, what if you can get long COVID from mild disease even too, right? Lingering symptoms, right? So there's benefit in that too. So it remains to be seen. Just know right now, immunocompromised, you should be getting that third dose. If you're not immunocompromised, but you're fully vaccinated, you just have to wait and see. We're going to be getting answers very soon. Wonderful. All right. And so uh, maybe we'll do one more and then we'll let you continue on. So I know this question came up earlier and I wasn't sure if we touched on it, but again, just looking at data um, regarding pregnant women, um, oh, yeah. what information do we have about vaccines and do we know if there's any um, development issues that can happen to the fetus? That's a great question. And so um, what again, it goes back to time that we have time now on our side, nine months um, and almost a year actually, if you go back to the original trial data. So the American College of uh, OBGYN and also what is called the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, those are the two top organizations that are comprised of all the, the ob gyn specialists. Um, they all agree that the COVID vaccine is safe for pregnant women to get, and they recommend it as well. Now we know that the, the, the Pfizer vaccine is FDA approved also. So if you had some concern about which one do you pick, then go with Pfizer since it's FDA approved. Now, how do we know that, right? So in the beginning, one is, I know there've been some concerns about fertility, but you know, it, it kind of came from, I think, misinformation that just spread like a rumor on the internet, but we haven't seen any problems with infertility on that. Um, we know that people who, when they enrolled in the study, they actually were not supposed to get pregnant after they got the vaccine, but there were people who went and got pregnant anyways, right? So we, we know that they got the vaccine and they still got pregnant. And then two, they followed that, that various system. So there's a separate pregnancy system for women who, get, uh, who are pregnant, who get vaccinated, they get followed. Also, they enter into a, a system voluntarily, they can report any kind of symptoms. And when they compare the rates of any kind of side effects that they've seen in this group, versus the normal amount of those kind of side effects in general in just the general population, they haven't seen a difference there. Um, I'll tell you what we have seen, and this is, this is tragic. And I, again, I don't, say this to, I don't say this to scare you, but it just, it made me pause. It made me just say, wow, is, you know, I've heard, I, I know personally, I haven't taken care of them, but I have doctors, friends, like not just friends of friends, but literally a friend who said, I took care of this pregnant woman um, and she just died of COVID. And it's just, just completely tragic. Um, and so I would encourage, um, you know, if you're pregnant is to, is that the, the organization say it's safe, you know, if you trust your ob gyn talk to your ob gyn about it. Thank you so much, Dr. Rattanison. So I do see additional questions and we'll have some more time to continue on with those. 
So I'd like um, Derek to go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll let you um, continue on with the presentation. Great, so let's talk about communicating about vaccines. And I, this might be a little different than what you're expecting. Um, let's go to the next slide. So let's review why um, some top reasons people are not getting vaccinated in our community. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I think the top five reasons we've seen is that the vaccines um, were not tested enough or they were created too quickly, um, concerned about potential side effects, afraid of actually getting COVID from the vaccine, concerned about infertility, pregnancy, and breastfeeding, or just worried that there's harmful ingredients in the vaccine. Next slide. And so also, why would there be um, concerns, right? And there, I think, are unique concerns to different groups um, based on their experiences in the past. So we know that um, for Black Americans, there can be distrust in the COVID uh, vaccine just based on the historical racism that they've uh, experienced. And so it's, you know, systemic barriers that actually um, caused harm to um, Black Americans. So um, I think it's important that we understand the perspective that different folks are coming from. And, um, you know, it's, it's important not to necessarily speak with this authoritative tone is you need to get this done because I said so, right? Is we have to have these conversations and talk about why, um, what's important to that person and what are their concerns? And if it's, well, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about the system that created this or uh, big pharma and, and, um, and the motives behind this, right? Is to address those concerns, acknowledge those concerns and have a discussion and, and, and um, make sure that those folks are heard. Next slide. So one is that the, you know that the, it was created too quickly to be safe. So um, the vaccine was really made from years of work. And while the steps were done quickly, none of the safety steps were skipped. What was really skipped was all the bureaucracy and all the red tape, okay, that was um, just cut and, and, and skipped. And also, so mRNA technology has actually been around for decades and, and tested. And I tell folks, it's almost like um, we've had players sitting on the bench this whole time and the players have been saying, put me in the game, coach, put me in the game. When is it my turn? And we just said, no, not, not your turn yet, right? And then it was like, boom, oh, it's your turn. Okay, are you ready? Oh, and by the way, we need this now. So, you know, here's a lot of money to figure it out, right? Think about all the things you have in your personal life. It's like, if only someone gave me this opportunity and the money to do this, I'm ready to go, right? And that's what happened with these vaccines. And it's important to understand that not everybody made the cut, okay? So you have like 15 companies that started out and now we're down to three companies, right? So it's not like this was a free-for-all that anybody could just come up with something and give to you. They had to prove their worth. And so um, that was already technology waiting in the wings, but once it got the green light, it got the money, it got the red tape cut, they were ready to go. And again, not everybody made it. Just those three, th those three companies here in the US right now. Next slide. Okay, how about that um, the vaccine was created too quickly to be safe? So I kind of talked about this already, right? So um, I, I just like a makeover TV show, right? Um, you ever see those makeover shows, how when all the resources come together, all the stars align, you got all the people on every trade ready to go. You've got the money ready to go. You've got a team ready to go. They can create something incredible in just a short amount of time. And that's really what we've seen with the COVID vaccine. Next slide. Okay, worried about side effects. And I totally get it, you know, so um, some of the side effects you may have heard already is almost feeling sick. So um, usually for about 48 to 72 hours, tired, headache, muscle pain, chills, fever, nausea. Um, in your arm, it might be uh, painful, redness, swollen. I also caution folks to think about, you probably know a lot of people who got vaccinated and they might say that they didn't feel really well. And uh, what I want to say is you're not hearing the stories of all the people who felt fine also. You know, it's, it's more interesting to say something when you felt really bad about something. But I'll tell you, I, my, my first shot, I just, my arm was a little sore. My second shot, I'm not going to lie, I was tired that next day. I felt pretty achy, irritable. I felt like a baby, to be honest. And I just thought if, if this is just like 1% of what COVID is like, I could not deal with real COVID, right? So uh, my side effects only lasted for about a day or so and went away. And this thing is, again, it's random. You know, my mom, she's 75, she felt nothing, you know, and, she, and uh, my dad has a lot of medical issues. Um, 75, um, he felt just a tiny bit tired, you know. Then we've got um, my wife who's uh, super fit, who um, felt pretty achy for about a day. I've got, I know another doctor who was able to ride 20 miles the next day, right? So it's, it really is, there's a, 
it's I know it's it's difficult to accept that there's a randomness to it, but um, but there is. Everybody's so unique and individual that um, so, some of these side effects could happen. And what are you feeling, by the way? You're feeling your own immune response revving up. That's what happens. Is um, your it's your body getting ready to to fight. And if you didn't feel those symptoms, though, it doesn't mean the vaccine didn't work. It, it still did. Again, everybody is an individual. Next slide. Okay, so what are some things you can do though to just you know get your immune system ready? So um, here's just some quick pointers. You could sleep at least seven hours, stay away from sweets, taking vitamin D, um, which is usually anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 units, um, increase your outdoor sun exposure. That helps you create natural vitamin D, potentially taking vitamin C, taking zinc and echinacea. These are over-the-counter supplements that people can take that might help. Um, you know, I didn't take any of these things to, to be honest. It's these are it's kind of in that that might category again. Is like they might help, but um, you know if it's important to you, um, you can you, you can try it. Um, otherwise, you don't have to. You know. Next slide. I'm still here. Yep. Next slide. Okay. Afraid of getting COVID from the actual vaccine. So. Um, it doesn't contain the virus at all. So you can't get COVID from the actual vaccine. Again, it's just a piece. It's not even a piece of the spike protein. It, it's the, the instructions to create it. So you won't get COVID from the actual vaccine. Your body destroys those instructions after it's done with it. Next slide. Okay, so I, I addressed this already, but uh, vaccine and fertility, I think there's you know stuff out there on the internet that talks about this. And though, um, you know, experts have looked at this again, the uh, uh, American College of, of uh, OBGYN, the Fetal Maternal Health Society, they've all agreed that um, there's no um, evidence that there's any kind of fertility issues with this. Um, and so it's okay to, you know, the vaccine won't cause any kind of fertility issues. Um, pregnant women can get vaccinated. If you're thinking about becoming pregnant, you can get vaccinated. And if I may ask a follow-up to that, just because I think there may have been some confusion. So it sounds like um, for women that have had complications, they are not vaccinated. Is that correct? Okay. Can you can you clarify again? I'm sorry, Monica. Yeah. So you mentioned someone had passed away from COVID oh. who was pregnant. So in yes. that particular case, were you saying this mother was not in fact vaccinated? Correct. Correct. Okay. They were not, they were not vaccinated. Yeah. And um, I and, and it's, I mean, I know it's just my personal stories, right? But it's I, I've heard them already from my own colleagues, and um, these were women in their 30s. It's just really tragic. Um, next slide. Um, uh, breastfeeding. So um, the no risk to breastfeeding. You can uh, get vaccinated even if you're breastfeeding. In fact, it's thought that um, you might even pass those antibodies. Um, you know, if you're vaccinated beforehand, that you might pass those antibodies to your baby and protect the baby as well. Go next slide. Okay, so um, thoughts that there could be harmful ingredients in the vaccine. So one, again, there's no live virus in the vaccine. Um, it does not have latex, egg, or iodine. Um, it, it's it's safe for uh, even the immunocompromised. And I want folks to think about that too, right? Is who did we give this vaccine to at the very beginning in January? Healthcare workers, but we gave it to the sickest of the sick, right? People in nursing homes who have, um, you know, really um, uh, severe medical issues like dementia, where they just have to be in bed all day or they're on oxygen or they can't care for themselves. If anybody was gonna get sick from the vaccine, right? It would have been them but they've been, they were the first to get it and they've been protected. In fact, what you saw is those folks, their, um, their curve, everybody was, everybody came down like this in terms of infections. We kind of slowly came down as a country, but what did we see in nursing homes? They went like that. Th their cases dropped rapidly because we got to them uh, first and quickest, okay? Um, and so um, there are no microchips in this vaccine. Just like any other thing, there are studies being done on different types of nanotechnology and stuff like that. Um, but no, no microchips in the actual vaccine. Next slide. All right, let's talk about how to have these conversations. Next slide. 
So this is something I am working on. Now I know kind of like today, I've kind of just been talking directly to you, but in a one-on-one -on -one situation, this would be different, right? Because what's really important is to elicit the perspective of the person you're talking to. And so I shouldn't be coming in that room and saying, you're not vaccinated, what? You need to go get vaccinated right now. It should be me just asking you what, what your thoughts are, right? What do you think about the vaccine? What, what concerns do you have the vaccine? Have you say the, have the person say the concerns and don't try to just go right at them again and say, well, that's not true and that's not true and that's not true, right? Is really, you just wanna find common ground there. You, you listen to the, to the person and you find common ground. What are you most worried about um, when it comes to COVID? Um, is there anything you're not doing right now because of COVID? And really um, that, that empowerment in the individual choice um, is, is important to really acknowledge that, you know, I, I know you wanna make the safest choice for yourself and for your family. Um, and I'm, I'm here to answer any questions about that. Next slide. All right, so it's five key messages. Next slide. So one is that the vaccine itself is safer than COVID. So, we know that 99% um, of all the patients in the hospital with COVID right now are unvaccinated. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what, what state it is, um, what political affiliation, what, what the ethnic makeup of is of that, of that state in places where there are unvaccinated folks. Um, those are the ones making mo um, comprising most of the hospitalizations and deaths, right? And I think one way to think about this is what we've seen is that the choice isn't really like the choice. The choice really has now become like either you're going to get either you're going to get COVID itself, or you're going to get vaccinated. There used to be that third option is well maybe I don't need to get the vaccine and I'm never going to get COVID. Right, that third option is just very highly unlikely because unless you're going to be a hermit inside your house for the rest of your life and not contact anybody, you know that third option is kind of out there. As we're going back to normal, it's two choices: either you're going to get COVID at some point, or um, you'll be vaccinated and protected against it. Okay, number two, side effects from the vaccine, they're common, but they're temporary. So those are the kind of things that might feel in a little tired, achy, headache, maybe a little swelling or redness at your arm for about a day or two, and then um, um, it should go away. Now, are there some rare side effects, like I said, like blood clots with J&J? &J? Yes, right? I want to be honest about that. Are they very rare, though? They have been very rare. So I think, again, like blood clots has been like 40 people in 13 million people. Um, the, the risk of getting COVID is greater in 2021 than it was in 2020. That is true. It's more, it's easily spreadable now. And um, now that lockdowns have ended, I think what we've seen is look at Florida. I think Florida is a great case to think about that. If you look at Florida, you'll see that their cases, their hospitalizations and their deaths, all of those COVID numbers are higher than they were than in the winter when everybody in the winter did terrible. They've actually gone worse than that now. And was I surprised by that? I really was surprised by that because they had a vaccination rate of about 50%, which I thought was pretty good. That was above the country's average at the time. It's like, oh, that's, that's pretty good. They should be protected. Um, but what you saw is that they had a rate that was higher than winter. And who are most of the people that were um, affected? It was the unvaccinated people, right? And that's what you saw when you tried, you know, they tried to go back to normal, but you don't have enough people vaccinated. Um, next slide. Um, vaccine was not created in a year. Again, all the necessary steps to produce a safe vaccine built over 10 years of research and science and all the stars just aligned to make it happen faster than usual. And again, I talked about this already, but really there's only two choices right now. Either you're going to get COVID or um, you're going you're gonna to get a vaccine and protect yourself. And let's say you do get COVID, right? The thing to think is even if you end up safe or what if you affect somebody you care about? And I think that's, that's really important to, to think about also. All right, next slide. So um, you're not gonna have all the answers right away. And you're not, I, most people I talk to, I don't, I'm not able to convince them that same day. So um, post-conversation, I acknowledge the personal choice, right? I want you to get vaccinated today, but I get it, it's your choice. I'm just here to help you. If you ever have any questions about it, let me know. I'll keep the lines of communication open. Trust is a journey again. You might not get there the same day. Give folks a, re a way to reach out to you that you're comfortable with um, as they consider their decision and then offer to find a vaccine. So again, very easy to do is help them find where to go and try to make it as easy as possible. And I'll tell you, that's what we try to do with our vaccine centers, right? Is you don't need an appointment you can show up. You don't have to be a member. You can choose your vaccine if that makes you more comfortable. Next slide. 
And it's okay to say, I don't know. I think, I think I'll, I'll say, you know, there's so much that we don't know. And that's the process is learning as you go along the way and having to readjust when you learn something new. And that is the scientific process. And so um, it's okay to say, I don't know. I, I, I think to acknowledge that. And if the data isn't available yet, then we say that, right? Um, and, but we wanna update folks as it becomes available. So for, to the question about, well, when can I get a booster? Should I get a booster if I'm immunocompetent? Um, if I have a normal immune system? I, you know, I don't know yet. I can tell you what's being discussed right now and is in the works, but we don't know yet for sure. So we just gotta stay tuned. Next slide. All right, so in conclusion, so uh, I, I, so I think sometimes we look at this as a sad story. I really think it's a, it's a, it can be a happy story is that we have the answer. It's right in front of us right now. It's getting vaccinated. Um, it will bring an end to the pandemic. We've seen in countries with high vaccination rates, we've seen less hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, vaccination helps prevent transmission. We need a higher percentage of people to get vaccinated in order to achieve that community benefit. So that's something we've learned here is as we, we got a whole lot of people vaccinated, right? but we need even more because it has protected tons of people, but um, we need to protect even more people because the, the margin that our health systems have in terms of being able to care for people in the ER, the hospital, outpatient, getting tested, right? You see that domino effect is, it doesn't take a whole lot of people to suddenly send that system into overdrive. Um, and so um, that's why it's important that, that we vaccinate more folks. And being vaccinated, it's someone's personal choice. It's our job to respect their choice and empower them to make an informed decision. And so that's, that's ultimately at the end of the day, we want to empower the person in front of us that it's a decision that they've made. Um, I wanted to say, uh, I wanted to talk about real quick, uh, there was a, um, in, in early July in Massachusetts, in, in Provincetown, there was an outbreak there. You might've seen it in the news where it said 75% of people who um, were fully vaccinated and they got infected, right? It made it sound like, oh, the fully vaccinated um, were most of the infections there. Because basically in Provincetown, it was 60,000 people who crammed into a town of 3,000, right? To party, okay? Um, but, mo and most of them were vaccinated. Yet out of the breakthrough cases that happened, they saw that about 75% were fully vaccinated yet still got sick. Not 75% of all the people that came, but of the small percentage of people who got sick. But what didn't happen there? What you'll see that didn't happen was that their hospitalizations and their deaths did not go up. So yes, some people got sick there, but all they had was like a cold. And so um, most of them were, uh, uh, were fine. And so they didn't get hospitalized. And so that's, that's an important point to make. So I guess I'm making that point is if you compare Massachusetts to Florida, for example, well, I can tell you in Massachusetts, they had a huge party in July, yet their hospitalizations didn't go up. Um, uh, because most of the people there were vaccinated. But you going to, going to Florida, unfortunately, is not as many people are vaccinated and the um, mitigation there of such as masking and crowd control in there is not as great. So you're seeing that happen right now is how their cases, hospitalizations and deaths are all higher than they were in winter. All right, next slide. All right, so um, I'm, I'm here for more Q&A, but yet, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what the, I'm, I don't know how our time is, but I'm here for all the Q&A. We're doing good. And actually what I'm going to say here as well is um, we'll ask a few more questions and then give the audience about a five minute break. Um, once we do that, I'd like to open the floor to both senior nurse Tran as well as you, Dr. Tannison, to ask, um, to answer some additional questions. And then we'll kind of jump more into um, any other pieces. So um, I did actually just want to start off by reminding everyone that there is a sign in sheet in the chat that I dropped in. So if all of you could be so kind to sign in, especially during the break, that would be greatly appreciated. So I'm going to ask just a few questions here before we jump into our break, and then we'll return with some additional Q&A. So one of the questions here is why do we offer the rapid test? Okay, so um, so the rapid test is a way to get tested, right? In in a, in a, in a convenient way. Um, if a rapid test, if you have symptoms and a rapid test is positive, then you can consider that a true positive, and know that okay, well, I don't have to go get the PS PCR test. I have symptoms. I've got this rapid test. It's positive. Um, 
the rapid test is can be positive and detect COVID at a, at a more narrow window than the PCR test, okay? So that's why you could still have it, but it just isn't positive yet. So why is it offered? One, it's a it's kind of back to that idea of how this is, a lot of this is not so much yes or no, there's gray area there. So it's a tool there that, it, that can be used on an individual level at, at home. But if it's negative, again, you still wanna get that PCR test. So a positive test, okay, I have symptoms. Um, I can presume I have COVID. A negative test and I have symptoms, I still gotta get the PCR test because that, that, that uh, rapid test, the antigen test has a narrower, narrower window. And so with that, would you be able to differentiate um, when someone's referring to the PCR and the antigen for the different types of testing? Yeah, so PCR testing is basically the, the, the traditional testing we've known since COVID started. You get it done in a lab. Um, you uh, have to, to put the swab in your nose. Um, th there are ways to do it now where it doesn't have to go so deep, but a lot of places still do the deep swab that goes uh, all the way to the back of the nasopharynx. But there are other swabs that can go in just the, the front of your nose right there. Those are done in labs. Um, rapid antigen testing is like a pregnancy test at home. So those you can buy over the counter. Now, that's my general overview. There are, I, I'm, I'm assuming there are labs that you can go to where they sell the rapid antigen tests. And there are some rapid PCR tests that are available also. They're just not widely available since the supply is so short, we limit using those to the hospital setting. It's like where you need to make a decision right then and there in the hospital, whether, well, you know, what kind of room does this patient go to? Um, but rapid PCR, um, again, that, that's not uh, readily available. So your choices essentially are formal testing, like for travel, right? You wanna go to Hawaii or something, right? They require usually a PCR test. That antigen test is kind of a, a quick way to make a decision um, that may not be perfect, but it's, it's at least a way to make a decision if you're about to, to do something. Great, thank you. So I think this will be our last question before we jump into our break. So going back to the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, since there was initially a risk of blood clots, um, do you think that those were related to the vaccine? Um, some people were thinking that that was kind of a lower risk at this point. Yeah, so it was related to the vaccine. And that I think is a good point is think about what it took to even detect that is that the time when Johnson & Johnson had rolled out and when they put a pause to it, they had found 13 blood clots. I mean, that's just remarkable to me that uh, out of 9 million shots were given, 13 blood clots were found. Like that's a needle in a haystack. Yet they found that needle in a haystack and they said, hold on, pause now. We need to figure out if this needle is real or not, okay? And so what they did was they found those cases and they said, okay, let's take that now. We have like 13 and 9 million how often does this clot occur, these types of, because it wasn't just any kind of blood clot, like in the leg or in the lung, these are special kind of blood clots. Um, they said, how often does that kind of blood clot just happen in general, just in the general community, no vaccine, no nothing. How often does that happen? Okay, it happens, but it's pretty rare. Okay, but it happened more often in these people who got the vaccine. Okay, so that's kind of like your statistical basis to realize okay, we now have a group of people who've had this rare blood clot happen more, more often than in this group of people who've never had the vaccine. Okay, we've got a statistical basis there now. Let's dive into that further, right? And so when they dove into that further, they said, okay, we found out that this risk is real. It is real, but it's luckily it's still very rare. And so, um, so then that is why it's the personal decision. If you, if you get Johnson & Johnson, there's a form on there that tells you, hey, this is a rare risk, it is real, but, um, but it's rare. If you want to elect to proceed with this, you can, you can, you know? And so I think one way of thinking about that, it's like you're getting in your car every day and there's a risk there, but you don't see the form in front of you. No one's telling you once you got in your car, like, hey, did you know get in your car right now? There, today you have a whatever percent risk of getting into a car accident and having something bad happen to you, right? So, um, but now we've had these decisions that are right in front of us with this data available. We make decisions about risk every day. But now that it's this one vaccine thing, that, that kind of reframes the question, right? Um, so at the end of the day, what I would say to you is if, if you're comfortable with that, that risk, because it's a very, very low risk, again, my wife was, then you can do it, right? But if you're someone who, let's say you're just like, I don't know, I don't feel, I'm, I'm usually the unlucky person, that's me, right? Then just take it out of the equation. Don't even consider Johnson & Johnson. Right. 
Thank you so much. So I know that was a lot of information. Um, we do hope that everyone will stay on the call with us, but at this time, I'd like everyone to be able to take a break for the next five minutes. On my end, I have 323. So if we can convene um, just a pinch before 3.30 and then we will finish up with today's presentation. Thank you so much and we'll see you all in about five minutes.
All right, welcome back everyone. Do we have everyone still on the line? Okay. Nurse Tran and Dr. Tanniston, have you been able to rejoin us? I'm here. All right. I'm here. Great. So um, thank you again, everyone. Hope you got a minute to stretch your legs, refill teacups. As we are wrapping up today's um, vaccine influencer training, I wanted to open the floor to both our nurse and doctor for any additional questions on what we've learned so far. I am seeing two additional questions in the chat. And so I would like to start off with one pertaining to any underlying conditions. Um, someone's referring to their son having Crohn di Crohn's disease and food allergies. Um, he is gonna be turning 16 this year. Would you recommend a vaccine for him? Do you think that that would be a safe option? And either doctor can answer this. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I don't know what EOE is, but I will say this. I know that the, essentially the, the, any kind of medical, there is no medical condition that uh, prevents somebody from getting the COVID vaccine and um, even food allergies even, right? So you can have anaphylaxis to peanuts and you can still get the COVID vaccine. Um, typically, if you had a history of anaphylaxis to something, you'll be monitored for 30 minutes. Um, but otherwise, the only reason somebody cannot get a COVID vaccine is one is because they've had anaphylaxis to the vaccine itself. And so that's kind of a catch 22 there because let's say you have, um, you get the first Moderna shot and you get anaphylaxis to that, okay? It means you shouldn't get the second one, but you could get Johnson and Johnson actually because it's a different vaccine with a different ingredient, okay? So you could still go on to get Johnson and Johnson. Let's say you have Johnson and Johnson vaccine, and then you get anaphylaxis from that. Um, it's kind of a catch-22 because you, you just had the vaccine, so you got it. So you're, you're now, you know, you're protected. You, you have anaphylaxis, but you got the vaccine. It worked. And so um, it just means you probably couldn't get Johnson Johnson again in the future if there was a booster or something like that. But those are really the only condition, like just anaphylaxis, or, or I'm sorry, not just anaphylaxis. I should say any type of allergic reaction, reaction to the vaccine itself. So if you got first dose of Pfizer, Moderna, and you got hives from it, then you are considered allergic to it and you shouldn't get the, the second dose. Um, if you've had COVID recently, when can you get vaccinated? So two options. One is, is if you're out of your isolation period and you know, you're no longer considered infectious or contagious from COVID, you can get the COVID vaccine. It's also reasonable to wait 90 days um, from that back, uh, from the time you were ill. Why? Because it's thought that your natural immunity is kicked in and doing really well during those first 90 days. So either or, if you want to get it sooner rather than later, you can, as long as you're out of isolation, or you can wait 90 days. Um, and then I'm sorry, one more thing is if you've had monoclonal antibody for COVID, right? So if you had Regeneron, let's say you had COVID and you had Regeneron treatment, then you should wait 90 days. But other than that, there is no medical condition that uh, prevents somebody from getting a COVID vaccine. In fact, if you're immunocompromised, it's more reason to get it. Okay, great, thank you so much. Let's see here. Um, okay, so if someone tested positive, what would the appropriate course of action be moving forward? I know there was an additional question earlier as well by asking the quarantine period. So just how do we move forward if you currently have COVID? So I, I can answer that question. Um, uh, thank you, Dr. Ret Retanison, for answering many of the questions. So uh, if you test positive, um, of course, um, we definitely uh, please isolate um, for, for 14 days. Um, those are, that's the recommendation. And so, and also those individuals that you have in close contact with, um, that, that includes um, uh, being within six feet and also uh, being uh, within six feet for, for 15 minutes or more. And that 15 minutes or more can be um, over the course of the 24 hour period. And so for those individuals who were in close contact, we suggest for them to quarantine as well. And for those individuals who are in quarantine, you can, uh, 
you could test between five and seven days after that last exposure. And you should get, if you are, if you are negative um, after that five to seven days, then you can be released from quarantine. Uh, for, the, uh, for the individual who is positive, um, definitely you'll get a call from the county um, and uh, you will, um, they, they can provide um, some type of resources if, if needed. Um, so, um, so that's, that's the uh, thing to do if you are, uh, are, are positive. Great, thank you so much. Now, someone's actually asking here, so if they cannot receive a second dose due to an allergic reaction, what would you recommend? Um, I think there's some questions if it's okay for people to overlap by doing one um, shot with Pfizer and one with Moderna. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, good question. So since they are both mRNA vaccines, then you cannot, if you had an allergic reaction to one, then you, you are considered allergic to the mRNA vaccine and should not be getting the other. Um, um, you could still get Johnson & Johnson. That would be your only alternative at this point. Okay. And um, I believe we may have skipped over, we answered portion of this, but just kind of going back to groups of people. So when we're looking that if not enough people are vaccinated, would this in fact provide more of an opportunity for additional variants to be developed or formed? Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought that up because I wrote that down and saw that I forgot <laughs> to, to answer that question. And yes, so essentially um, variants form because mutations are made. What are, what are mutations? Mutations are basically errors when the virus is replicating and trying to produce another copy of itself. The more it does that, the more mistakes it makes. And when it makes those mistakes, those mistakes are mutations. And those, those mistakes can end up being a problematic like Delta. And so you then get a mistake that is a mutation that causes a variant that uh, that mistake happens to be more transmissible or we don't, we don't know of one yet, but what if there was a variant that was more deadly actually, right? So what we know Delta isn't necessarily more deadly than uh, the typical COVID, but it is, um, it's, uh, it's more transmissible, it happens quicker. Um, and so the more, the, the more people are getting infected out there, the more chances the virus has to replicate and make mutations and then form into variants. So if we can vaccinate more people, well then we lower the risk of people getting infected in the first place. So if you lower the amount of people that get infected, you lower the amount of times the virus has a chance to replicate. And so times that by, you know, 5 billion people in the world, then, then you're really kind of decreasing the chances that the virus gets, um, gets to mutate and make a variant. Basically for, the, to, for variants to happen, the virus needs to stick around and be able to replicate, right? Well, if people are vaccinated and it can't replicate, then it can't make a variant. Great answer, thank you so much. And I think that's it. I know there are a few additional slides, but just wanted to see, um, Nurse Chan, if you had anything you wanted to add from the questions that were asked. Uh, no, I don't, but I, I was looking um, back at a previous presentation and this is something I wanted to uh, bring up, um, just uh, some of the public health statistics. Um, so it, back in June, um, the, uh, the the Af African uh, Black American or Black individuals, um, they were behind um, in the uh, the death rate uh, compared to uh, white white individuals. But uh, as of now, um, that has surpassed white individuals. And so, um, and you know, so in addition, um, uh, the the cases the cases for uh, Black individuals um, before um, it was. Uh, white individuals, more cases uh, per, per 100,000. And now um, that is kind of flipped. So uh, black individuals have a higher case rate than, uh, than, than white individuals. So I just wanted to mention the, the importance of getting vaccinated um, and especially for groups that, um, that, that have, you know, that are, that the, this health disparity is less. So we're just trying to, um, to increase, if possible, the vaccination rates just to kind of help these individuals, um, these, these certain groups that are, 
that are, are less uh, less served. So that's that's all I wanted to mention. Thank you, thank you so much for providing that additional information. So it sounds like you know when you're looking at the black community, perhaps for communities where there's a um, kind of a higher risk for underlying conditions, maybe that's varying from high blood pressure, stress, those types of things. Would you say that that's kind of um, making the black community a little more susceptible to having these higher rates of COVID and unfortunately, ultimately, some of the more severe side effects with hospitalization and death? Um. I can answer that. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that plays a role into it. So the, um, the existing medical conditions, chronic conditions, um, access to care, um, socioeconomic factors, all of those, it's, it's, uh, it's complex, but they all play a role. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I saw, um, I was look, looking back, back through the questions again, I might be paraphrasing this wrong, but I think one question was, you know, why, um, why is it important that everyone vaccinate or, you know, if, if, um, if uh, maybe I'm, re I'm probably reading into the question or projecting, but I think the question that I've seen sometimes is, well, if you're protect, if I'm protected from getting, if I'm vaccinated and protected, why do I need somebody else to get vaccinated? Because um, I'm protected. So shouldn't I be happy already? Right. And, and why, why, why does it, what does it matter that I try to protect somebody else? Right. I think the, it goes back to that, that domino effect again. So COVID is different than like having a heart attack or emphysema or asthma in that it's, it's, it spreads. And so if you're sick, you can affect somebody else, um, even though you said it's, it's your health, but you can affect somebody else. And the other big part of that is that domino effect. So right now here in Sacramento, I, I'll tell you that, um, that domino effect affects non-COVID care. So when all of the resources are being pulled to treat COVID, we have less time and resources for non-COVID care. So that's why it may take longer to see a doctor because we're so busy dealing with COVID. You know, for all the positive results that we get, right? That takes up time too. We've got to tell patients about um, the positive test. So now I'm, I, I'm you know, I can't focus on the regular care. And then to top that all off is, all the folks who put off their care last year, um, because we asked you to, right? Flatten the curve, like we need to hold everything accountable. I mean, we have to hold, put a hold on everything. Well, that stuff is needed now. It's like, well, how, long, how much longer do you want me to hold? I need to see a doctor now, right? For a non-COVID reason. And absolutely, we need to see you, but the resources are limited. And so when you, if you go to an ER and it's filled with um, people who are sick because of COVID, then that takes away care from you, um, right? And so you might've seen some of those stories where in places where they're really impacted, they put out messages saying, hey, please only call 911 if you really need to, right? That, that's kind of like a very vague message. Like, how do we expect patients to even know, like, do I need to call 911 or not? A lot of patients just don't know. So, you know, they call or, you know, they're afraid, right? And so you just see that huge domino effect is that our health systems, are not built to um, go into overdrive for us a long period of time. You might hear about it sometimes where health systems will say, okay, we are too full right now, but it then dissipates. You know, you fix it after a few hours or after a day or something like that, right? But now what we're seeing is like weeks to months at a time where it's like that, then it gets better and then it comes right back again a few months later. And so I think that's the, that's the portion here is like, even if you're not worried about COVID for yourself, um, this, this domino effect will affect non-COVID illness, our ability to care for folks with, um, with something else. And uh, that's why it's, it's so important that we try to stop the spread as much as possible um, by getting vaccinated. Great, thank you. So Nurse Chan, I know that you mentioned the quarantine time being 14 days. And so if someone has been exposed, um, would you recommend them going to get tested um, directly after that 14 day period? I mean, is that, I think the idea is if you're, expo if you're exposed to someone who has COVID, um, just to be on the safe side, you're gonna wait 14 days and, and quarantine, would you recommend that you go ahead and get tested directly after those 14 days? So, uh, so let me clarify. So if you are, um, 
if you are exposed to someone who's COVID positive, mm -hmm. um, it is recommended that you you, cor uh, you quarantine. But within, uh, so uh, five to seven days after the last time you met that person, that COVID positive person, uh, it is recommended um, you can test um, at five to seven days because at that time, the incubation period um, you know, the test, the, the virus will incubate and the test will be uh, sen uh, sensitive enough to, to, uh, to give you a true indicator. So if you, if you were exposed to somebody and then you tested the following day, the, the test is not um, sensitive enough to, 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 to detect that. So you have to wait a certain period of time. So that's if, if a person who is, you know, supposedly negative in contact with someone who is COVID positive. So you don't, uh, the isolation is for 14 days for the individuals who are COVID positive. So I just wanna clarify that. And then let's see. Um, so the thing is, if you are COVID positive, we do not recommend for you to get tested um, soon after because, um, so the, the importance of the isolation period is people are infectious within that 14 days. Um, so we, we want you to quarantine, stay at home, uh, try to stay away from other individuals. And so, um, but if, so after the 14 days, you're not infectious. Uh, you're not infectious anymore, I should say. And if, if you try to get another test, maybe a month later, um, you will still test positive, but you are not infectious uh, because you are still shedding uh, virus, but you are not infectious. Dr. Uh, Ratanasan, he can probably mention more regarding that, but um, you can test positive up to uh, up to three months, even to six months after you have a COVID positive uh, test. And so uh, we don't recommend it um, after um, uh, three months or, or we don't recommend it within three months of you getting a positive result. Okay. So Thank please you. Please correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Ratanasan. No, that's correct. Yeah, because the, the PCR test is essentially detecting uh, dead virus. And so it's, it's possible, like you were saying, to, to shed the virus, meaning you're no longer infectious or contagious, but you've still got pieces of virus um, that can come up positive on a test. Great. And um, let's see, um, we've got one more question here. Um, so if someone's asthmatic, um, I hope I'm saying this correctly, asthmatic or asymptomatic, um, are you always passing COVID on to others? So I Is there think a way to the, know for sure? I think they meant asymptomatic maybe. Right. Um, yeah, so, so like like we, like I said before, if you are in symptomatic uh, COVID positive, uh, you quarantine for those 14 days. Once you are, you finish your isolation period of the 14 days, you are no longer infectious. And so, um, so you can go out in the world and, and such. So you don't have to isolate anymore, but you are not infectious after those 14 days. So it sounds like if you are asymptomatic, you still can pass it on to others if you are not in quarantine. So, yes. Yeah, so if you are asymptomatic and within those 14 days from the, the test date, um, you can pass it on within those 14 days. After those 14 days, then you should be good to go and you don't have to isolate anymore and you won't pass it on um, after the 14 days. Great. Thank you so much. So um, Derek, if you don't mind, we do have just a few more slides. Um, I know we have about 10 minutes left, so maybe we could just jump into some closing remarks. And then again, we'll still be looking at the Q&A if there's additional questions that come in. All right, so I can um, touch base on these um, last few talking points, because um, again, every life is precious and really looking at why you matter. Um, it makes sense that you may have some influence on the vaccine acceptance or hesitancy, but you, know, you are all here today to learn and be able to make the most informed decision for yourself, your loved ones, your clients, and as an influencer, you know, we can really be able to improve community immunity. 
Um, so we really want to thank you all for being here and just hope that the more and more that you learn and have time to really process this information, it can allow us to come together as a collective and look at kind of the greater cause to be able to tackle this um, disease. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so as a reminder, um, I did put a sign-in sheet in the chat because in this slide here, um, this sign-in sheet will also ask you what your t-shirt size is. And so for participating, everyone's gonna be given a um, complimentary t-shirt on behalf of Sacramento County, um, Kaiser Permanente, the Center at Sierra Health Foundation, as well as the Sacramento County um, COVID-19 CoLab. Now, um, this was a question that came up a lot in the chat. So for those of you looking for additional information, where to get tested, where to get your vaccine, these are some helpful resources that can guide you in the right direction. We will be emailing everyone um, the recording of today's call, or excuse me, today's webinar. But if you have your phone handy, I would encourage you just to snap a photo of this slide and then you can refer back to this later as well as pass this on to your networks. And so once again, on behalf of everyone that was able to come together and put this webinar in session, um, we really wanna thank you, um, Sacramento County Public Health, Kaiser Permanente. We also had some additional support from Vaccinate All 58 and the San Francisco Department of Public Health. Um, I would also like to help our um, wonderful moderator, Derek, who has been leading the technical side behind our presentation today, as well as our ASL interpreters and all of our translators, as we had an array of languages being translated on the back end for um, everyone in the community to be able to listen and learn. So if there are any final remarks, um, Nurse Tran or Dr. Rutanison that you would like to add, please feel free to do so before we let everyone get on with the rest of their afternoon. Thank you thank so you. much. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, everybody, for uh, attending this presentation. We hope that uh, with this information, you can be an ambassador and spread the word and try to decrease vaccine hesitancy and try to improve that vaccine uptake. So thank you all for attending. Thank you, everybody, Monica, you did a wonderful job. Derek, you, everybody, Dr. Rat, Ratanasan, you did amazing. Thank you all for attending. And uh, hopefully we can kind of build upon this and continue our efforts in trying to vaccinate uh, all 58. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanna second those comments and say thank you for everybody for um, your time and, um, Again, I think that personal connection is important. If you think about it, folks out there, at this point, um, many people have been vaccinated. So uh, you don't have to listen to me. If, if there's somebody out there that you know, it's very likely that someone you care about, someone you trust, someone you respect um, has been vaccinated. And um, at the end of the day, they, they, uh, they, they love, they trust, they respect you too. So I, I encourage you to ask them about it too. All right. So without further ado, I will give everyone their five minutes back. And again, if you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out to any of the individuals you see here on this slide. And we look forward to staying in touch with you. Thank you all so much for your participation today.